It's March 2000. 23-year-old Leah Roberts sits at her usual table, writing in her journal and trying to figure out life's next move. She used to hang out at this coffee shop, Cup of Joe. I think she would have loved to write the next great American novel. For her, it was a way to get things down on paper and probably good for her soul. Leah was very uh, philosophical. I, I guess some people would call her an old soul. You know, she seemed like somebody who was really wise beyond her years. Just a few credits away from earning a degree in Spanish and anthropology from North Carolina State University, Leah has decided there is more to life than graduating college. She kind of resented it and disagreed with the fact that you should get a degree to move on with life. She was interested in, you know, that life adventure, figuring out why we're here, what we're doing. But even with her free spirit, Leah's older siblings feel quitting school months before graduation is a rash decision. I remember talking to her one time and saying, just tough this out for six months. And, you know, she didn't like being told that. It's Thursday morning. Leah Roberts gets a routine call from her older sister in Durham to see how she's doing. It was kind of the same sort of conversations about what she was going to do with her life, but nothing to indicate that I wasn't going to talk to her the next day. With just two years between them, the sisters are close and talk often. But even with their solid relationship, Kara has no idea what is about to transpire. We didn't make plans. I think it's just one of those things. I'll talk to you when I talk to you next. There was no reason to be concerned. But close friends have been noticing changes in Leah's personality and have concerns of their own. She would go out places by herself and she would meet people while she was out, which you know, isn't that big of a deal. But then to be doing it constantly and then really not having any contact with your friends, I was definitely worried about that. She would go to the coffee shop all day and she would work on her computer and she would, you know, make new friends. People that got her thinking outside of Raleigh, you know, and Durham. It's hard for Leah's core group of friends to see the outgoing girl they grew up with pulling away from them, especially knowing how difficult the previous several years have been for Leah and her family. When Leah was just 17 years old, and a senior in high school, her safe and carefree life in the suburbs of Durham was interrupted. Her father was diagnosed with a life-threatening respiratory disease. While dealing with one seriously ill parent, the Roberts siblings had no idea that another storm was brewing. We always kind of focused on my dad, but my mom was not doing so well all along, and it, it wasn't quite as obvious. Leah was just 20 years old, a sophomore in college, when her mother died suddenly from heart disease. It's kind of the first realization of your own mortality. So to experience that at Leah's age, I think would be even more, you know, of a shake to the foundation of your, of your life and your beliefs. She wrote about feeling like she had been born again, born into this new life without a mom. After taking some time off from school, Leah returned to NC State the following semester in the fall of 1998. It was then that Leah suffered yet another life-changing event. A transfer truck turned in front of her and she had no choice but to run straight into it. The near fatal accident left Leah with a punctured lung and shattered femur, requiring doctors to place a metal rod inside her leg. She talked about feeling like she was going to die immediately before the crash. But given a second chance, Leah decided she was going to live life to the fullest. Leah was somebody who wanted to see the world and spread her wings. She studied a semester abroad in Spain and then enlisted for a field study program in Costa Rica. Then, just three weeks before she was scheduled to leave, in the spring of 1999, Leah's father passed away. Leah's faced with, you know, do I stick around here for the summer or do I continue with my plans and go to Costa Rica? So a month or so after Dad passed away, she headed down to Costa Rica. 
I went to visit with her just to have a vacation. I was worried about her during our time in Costa Rica because she did not seem to be affected at all by her father's death. Instead of mourning for her father, Leah decided to make the most of her experience in Costa Rica. Her time there seemed to have a big impact on her changing worldviews. I do think that she rejected the idea that she had to live her life the same way that everybody around her was living theirs. Now, eight months after her trip to Costa Rica, it is clear that Leah Roberts wants to break free from her past. She's been taking guitar lessons, dabbling in photography, and spending hours documenting life in her journals. She was buying a lot of music, buying a lot of books. It was almost like she was searching for something. After talking to her sister earlier that morning, Leah confirms a plan to babysit with her roommate the next day. We had made plans on that Friday to go babysit. Friday came and she never showed up. I thought maybe she forgot or maybe something came up and she just wasn't able to do it. When Nicole returns home and Leah is not there, she doesn't think much of it. We sometimes didn't see each other for a day or two. I would get up for work and she would still be in bed or she'd be in bed when I got home from work, so it didn't seem unusual to me. But after two days pass and still no sign of Leah or her car, Nicole starts receiving phone calls that are cause for concern. She had missed people and had made all these different plans, but she never made it to any of the plans that she half started. So then we were really worried. Coming up, Leah's sister finds a cryptic note in Leah's bedroom. It was just out there. <laughs> After surviving the deaths of her parents and a near-fatal car crash, 23-year-old Leah Roberts is searching for answers. When she pulls away from her core group of friends and quits college, those closest to her become concerned about her emotional state. Then, after a phone call with her sister and making babysitting plans with her roommate, she disappears. roommate Nicole called me that Sunday around noon and you know asked me if I had seen Leah during the next 24 hours Leah's sister Kara and Leah's friends call everyone they know in a fruitless attempt to find out where Leah has gone on Monday morning the young women meet at Nicole and Leah's house to strategize their next move nobody has seen either Leah or her car since Thursday she was driving a white Jeep Cherokee uh, had a good number of miles on it. When Kara showed up, I think she was very worried to begin with. She walked directly in the door and went directly into Leah's room. Judging by the state of Leah's room and the things that are missing, it is clear to Kara Leah has left voluntarily. It didn't give me concern that someone had done something to her. I could just tell that she had packed up and taken certain things. Although they agree Leah left on her own accord, knowing her emotional state, Kara and Leah's friends alert the police. If Leah did leave voluntarily without telling anyone, the girls are concerned she might not be thinking clearly. We went down to the Raleigh Police Department downtown and filed a missing persons report. There wasn't a lot they could do because we had nowhere for them to even start. We were all pretty worried and concerned about her. We are also just angry that if she did leave on purpose that she didn't tell anyone. On Tuesday, the day after the report is filed, Kara returns to Leah's house to see if perhaps she overlooked something that would give her some indication of where her sister has gone. What she finds heightens the mystery. I was able to locate the note that she had left for her roommate, Nicole. It was a fold-up piece of paper with a picture of, like, the smile of the Cheshire cat. So 
so that was a little creepy. Leah was known to be a big fan of the popular children's book, Alice in Wonderland. For Kara, the Cheshire Cat's smile is not likely an insignificant doodle. I kind of wondered if it wasn't the cat that always disappears and reappears out of nowhere. I feel like it might have meant to her, here's my grin, it's here, it's gone, and it'll be back. Inside the folded up letter, Kara also finds a stack of cash. The note from her younger sister begins by explaining the money is for bills. It was to cover expenses for about a month, so. Uh, I felt like she'd be back in a couple of weeks, you know, at the most. But as Kara reads on, the note becomes less clear. Someone described it as cryptic, and I would say that was a good description. It was just out there. Kara and Leah's friends wonder what was going on in Leah's head as she wrote her note. Then, Kara reads a side note written on the left-hand margin of the letter, referencing the 50s Beat Generation author Jack Kerouac and his legendary book, on the road, the message speaks volumes to Kara. Leah had talked to me about Jack Kerouac. I think she kind of romanticized about that sort of lifestyle. Here he is in the 50s, traveling across the country with hardly any cash, and he described this beautiful country. And I feel like she was maybe itching to get out on the road and do some soul searching. The note seemed very happy. I mean, she seemed very happy about what she was doing. Nicole recalls a conversation she had with Leah several weeks earlier. Leah had mentioned to me, just in conversation, hey, let's just take a trip across the country. You know, let's just get in a car and go out to California. It sounded great, but I was working. I didn't have the money. I couldn't just jump in the car spontaneously and go. But Leah could. She had no job, no responsibilities, and she was no longer in college. She had inherited some money from her parents, which would have given her the financial means to up and leave. For Leah's brother, Heath, Leah's goodbye note and departure make perfect sense. It just made it sound like she wanted to go follow in Kerouac's footsteps and she might be gone for a little while, but that she was gonna be back. Although they are concerned, apparently Leah does not want anyone to lose sleep over her decision to leave. I think she just needed to get away from her life to figure out a plan and to <laughs> just kind of soul search. In the note, she tells her sister not to worry and that she is far from depressed. I think that made me feel a little bit better, finding the note. I still need to know where she was because I <laughs> kind of looked after her always. The looming question is, where did Leah go? And why hasn't she tried to contact anyone? Kara is determined to find out the answer. And luckily, she has a starting point. Kara had been given power of attorney when Leah went to Costa Rica because she was going out of the country. And so Kara was able to um, tap into her credit cards and ATM cards. I was able to get her bank records that afternoon. And I could see that she was headed west on I-40. That's when we finally got a hint that she was going across the country. Coming up, Leah's lark turns into her sister's worst nightmare when a disturbing note is delivered to Kara's door. I don't know why her car would have been found there. <laughs> After finding a goodbye note addressed to her roommate, family and friends of Leah Roberts are trying to understand her decision to leave home for an adventure on the road. They want to believe she is safe, but they can't be sure. When her sister Kara obtains Leah's bank statement, she is able to follow a money trail mapping out Leah's plan, a road trip across the country that began just after the last time they spoke on Thursday, March 9th talked to her the day she left. There was no reason to think I wasn't going to talk to her again. 
She left that evening, I think around six o'clock. Went to the bank that afternoon, withdrew $3,000 cash, and hit the road. Leah is able to traverse the country in less than four days. According to her bank statement, she checks into a hotel near Memphis, Tennessee on March 10th, and then only uses her debit card for gas until the last posted transaction on March 13th in Brooks, Oregon. At first, Kara has no idea why her sister is headed to the Pacific Northwest. It didn't make sense at the time, and I didn't think there was any specific reason for her to go there, but it seems like she had a very deliberate path. But on March 13th, the money trail stops. Kara knows Leah made it to Oregon, but now there is nothing left for her to do but wait. I kind of felt like I would hear from Leah. At least I was hoping I would, and just kind of feeling like we can't do anything. She's an adult. Meanwhile, Leah's friends are still baffled by her abrupt departure. They, too, want answers. I just knew that something was really wrong with the situation, and I just felt this horrible, just scared, really scared that something bad was getting ready to occur. Nicole and Susie hit the pavement, seeking out Leah's new acquaintances to see what they know. During that time was when we started hearing from people about the whole Jack Kerouac connection. And then they finally come across a woman from the coffee shop whom Leah has confided in. We talked a lot about Jack Kerouac because we had both read Dharma Bombs. And in the book, he had gone over to Washington State in the mountains and had thought a lot about what was important to him. It kind of resonated with her. She wanted to go over there and just be alone and figure everything out because she'd been going through a tough time. According to Janine, Leah was not sad or depressed about her life, but was indeed yearning for answers. I totally knew that she was going to take off and go to the mountains because she wanted to go where Jack Kerouac had gone. She wanted to be on the road and be a free spirit and go and figure herself out. After nine days without any word from Leah, Kara can't hold out much longer. It's Kara's 26th birthday, and she fully expects to hear from her sister. But instead of a phone call, she receives an ominous message from Bellingham, Washington. When I got home on the morning of my birthday and found a note from the local sheriff's department, I found out that Leah's car was found in Bellingham. I had never heard of the area, and um, just trying to make sense of why her car would have been found there. Just one day earlier, in a remote area of wilderness, nearly 3,000 miles from North Carolina, a local man and his wife were taking an early Saturday morning run up a mountain road in a majestic pine forest. As he's walking down that road, he noticed some clothes in the trees. And as he looked down the, uh, the ravine, he saw a vehicle. He went down the ravine and found a passport and ID, called 911 to report a, a vehicle in the ditch. A white Jeep Cherokee with North Carolina plates was found wrecked and abandoned off an old logging pass called Canyon Creek Road in the Mount Baker National Forest, about 30 miles east of Bellingham, Washington. A deputy from the Whatcom County Sheriff's Department responded to the scene. When he uh, got to that vehicle, the, the deputy thought it was suspicious in a sense that there was a vehicle down the embankment, closed everywhere. But it, it could be real common in, the, in this county. We get these a lot. People have been up drinking, they'll crash their vehicle, go down, they'll report it uh, later on. It was treated like a, um, a crash vehicle, but it was unique because it was out of North Carolina. The Jeep was left with blankets and pillows covering the blown out windows. Personal items like a checkbook, a guitar, music CDs, and bags of clothing are strewn across the area. But the one obvious thing missing from the scene is the driver. It doesn't take investigators long to figure out the car belongs to a woman named Leah Roberts from North Carolina. 
They call the Raleigh police, who are able to link the wrecked vehicle to the missing persons report filed five days earlier. At that time, it went from just, you know, a vehicle down the ravine to a missing persons case. A police officer is sent to Kara Roberts' home with a note to call a sheriff's department in Washington State. Kara is sickened when she gets the news about the car. The worst thing that was supposed to happen to me was that my mom passed away unexpectedly. But now we're looking for our little sister. There's no sign of her other than the car. And it's in a place thousands and thousands of miles away. When Kara called me to tell me that they found the car, I remember just breaking down and crying because I knew something really bad had happened. Kara and Heath Roberts decide to take a trip out west to help locate their baby sister. Meanwhile, police in Whatcom County investigate the site where they believe there has been an accident. It looked like the vehicle went somewhere between 30 to 40 miles per hour. Um, it was going uphill. Investigators are able to determine the speed, judging from the damage done to the trees as the Jeep tumbled over the embankment. It sheared off some trees that were three to four inches around, and then it looked like it tossed. It went end over end and then side to side. Everything in the vehicle was being tossed out of the vehicle. So if someone was in it, it would have been uh, severely uh, injured, or if they're tossed out, you'd expect them to have been somewhere near the vehicle. Yet the investigator sees no sign that Leah was injured either inside or outside the Jeep. It didn't present itself as anyone in the vehicle. And a lot of times you look at the windshield and see if there's head damage or something like that, or damage to the, uh, to the steering wheel, and you didn't see any of that. And you would have thought there would have been trails of some kind of blood. We just didn't see it. Four days after Leah's Jeep was found, Kara and Heath Roberts arrive in Bellingham, tracing their sister's last known whereabouts. When they witness the beauty of Bellingham, they understand why their sister was drawn here. The city of Bellingham was, was very nice, you know, it's a, it's a little small town, very quaint looking, but it didn't take very long to get outside of town into an area that I would describe it as wilderness. But it looked like an area where, you know, if you don't know how to survive, you might not. Police bring Heath and Kara to the accident site shortly after their arrival. Seeing Leah's last whereabouts leaves an indelible mark. It's kind of in the middle of nowhere, and her trail ended there. Her car was here. There's no sign of Leah. You know, where could she have gone? Coming up. Kara and Heath uncover a critical lead in the search for their sister. Somebody there had to have some kind of knowledge of what had happened to her. Get more Disappeared online at investigationdiscovery.com. Nine days after 23-year-old Leah Roberts left her home in Raleigh, North Carolina, it appears as if her cross-country adventure has come to a crashing halt. Police find her wrecked car in a national forest in Washington State, but no signs of Leah. The accident scene leaves Leah's family and investigators mystified. The seatbelt wasn't strained. There was no mark on the windshield where they would have hit their head. No blood but yet these blankets were covering the windows. It made me wonder, you know, did she hit her head and wander off or wander down to the road and hitchhike out? The condition of the car didn't provide any answers. It almost made it more of a mystery. We didn't find any tracks or, or any marks that somebody who was trying to leave a trail, you know, might have left. And, of course, we didn't find Leah. If Leah sustained injuries from the crash, it appears she hasn't asked anyone for help. There are no records of any area hospitals treating an injured or disoriented woman since March 13th, the day that activity on Leah's credit card stops. Seeing the car leaves Leah's brother with two very contradictory scenarios of what might have happened to his free-spirited little sister. 
either Leah had had an accident in the car and had wandered off and was intentionally staying out of contact with people or that something bad had happened to her, some sort of foul play. What could have happened to Leah? Police and family believe the answers lie somewhere in that vehicle. That car has something to tell us because we don't have a crime scene. We don't have a body. All they know is that Leah paid for gas in Oregon on March 13th, and then her car was found here on this mountain five days later. What happened in between and after is anybody's guess. Then they find a crucial clue. As investigators begin to sift through Leah's belongings, they come across a box. They found it like in like a little memory box. It was like something wanted to keep a piece of memorabilia. That's why that was interesting. Inside the box is a movie ticket stub for the critically acclaimed film American Beauty. The ticket is from a movie theater at Ellis Fair Mall in Bellingham, 30 miles away, and is dated for the afternoon of March 13th. Now investigators have a new piece of the timeline leading up to Leah's disappearance. We do know she had a gas receipt from Oregon at 12.50 in the morning of Monday, so she drove from Brooks, Oregon to Bellingham, which is a five, six hour drive. The ticket would put Leah in the city for at least several hours until the 2.10 p.m. showing of the movie at the mall. Heath and Kara are hopeful that someone in Bellingham remembers seeing Leah. It didn't seem possible that she could have come through Bellingham and not interacted with at least some of the local populace. And so somebody there had to have some kind of knowledge of what had happened to her when she was in town. With the detective's help, the Robert siblings generate a missing persons flyer to circulate around Bellingham. They start at the cinema at Bellis Fair Mall. They didn't remember Leah at the movie theater, so we decided to start asking around in the food court. And I immediately noticed a type of restaurant I thought Leah would go to. There's only one sit-down restaurant in the mall. Kara believes if Leah had a meal, it would have been here. As it turns out, she's right. They remembered her sitting at the bar. There were a couple of other patrons on either side of her, but she was alone. This is promising news for Kara and Heath. It gave us another piece of Leah being in Bellingham. Having this new lead gives them hope that the investigation into their sister's disappearance will continue as they head back east to Durham. Heath and I spent four days up in Washington finding out what was going on, meeting with media, passing out flyers. And at a certain point, what do you do? We came on home. The next day, one of the restaurant patrons that was seen talking to Leah phones in a tip. The man described her as a very warm, talkative individual, willing to share about her life a little bit. The caller wants police to know there was another individual sitting on the other side of Leah, whom she was also talking with. The second individual is contacted by police. I remember having lunch with her and having a conversation with her. He, he gave us a description of, of her and, and that she talked about uh, Jack Kerouac. They talked about him and about why she came out. Then, the second man gives police another intriguing clue. According to him, Leah did not leave the restaurant alone that day. The second individual gave us a description of this individual. Uh, he called Barry, who Leah left with. His description of Barry is so detailed, police bring in a sketch artist. The image rendered now portrays a possible suspect in Leah's disappearance. But police are concerned. The story the second individual gives does not mesh with the account given by the first man the one who called in the tip. He never talked about her leaving with somebody else. He said she left alone, and then uh, this other individual said he, she left with somebody else. Since police cannot verify the second individual's testimony, they begin to suspect the story of Barry, the man in the sketch, is a ruse. But at this early stage of the investigation, they are not ready to rule anything out. Leah's car has been towed to a secure facility, and both Whatcom County detectives and the FBI have begun to process the car, looking for any additional evidence that might indicate foul play. The vehicle was impounded and then taken to evidence storage. There, uh, a couple crime scene deputies started processing all the clothes. 
they went through all that stuff again. It's been 12 days since Leah's Jeep was found off Canyon Creek Road, and three weeks since Leah went missing. Now, police stumble upon evidence that more strongly suggests something very bad has happened to Leah Roberts. She had, I believe, somewhere around $2,500 with her that she left with. We found a pair of pants in the vehicle with $2,400 inside the pocket. It appears as though Leah has spent little money since the 13th of March, the day she was seen leaving the restaurant. If she was going to live in Bellingham for four or five days, she had to live somewhere. And it uh, doesn't look like she used a lot since Monday. And then, under a floorboard in the Jeep, they find Leah's most sacred possession. We also found a ring, and it was her mother's ring. The question is why she would have taken it off. In fact, one of her friends said she would have never taken it off. That was a very, very sacred item for her. And I don't care what kind of emotional state she was in, unless she had some kind of serious mental disorder or something, she would have never left that ring, never. She took everything of value with her, and everything of value was still left in her car. It is becoming increasingly clear that whatever Leah's intentions were for embarking on this road trip, something very sinister got in the way of her realizing her dream. I think she was on a journey. She left the notes and everything's going to be fine. Says, I think the journey stopped in Bellingham. And we don't know why it stopped, what brought it to stop. But I don't think Leah brought it to stop. Coming up, police find new evidence in Leah's wrecked car seven years later. No one's ever opened the hood. After finding a large sum of cash, along with her mother's engagement ring, inside Leah Roberts' abandoned and wrecked vehicle, police are concerned that she might have been intentionally harmed. The last person believed to have seen her alive in a Bellingham restaurant tells police she left with another man, but police question the witness's credibility. All they can do now is keep searching for Leah. They begin on Canyon Creek Road. It was within two weeks of the crash that search and rescue team comes out. Although hopes of finding Leah alive are fading, police call in a highly trained search team. They map out an area where an injured Leah could have gone had she escaped the wreckage. Aerial was done, a uh, helicopter is flown over, dogs are brought in, no stone is un left unturned. They search above the car and below, all the way down to the Nooksack River. They um, weren't able to find anything else, no sign of Leah. Um, you know, could they have missed her? Yeah, I mean, it happens, but they did search the area. Now, police are fairly certain that Leah was not injured in that accident. In fact, they are now beginning to believe no one was actually in the car when it crashed. But for Leah's brother Heath, this doesn't prove that Leah was never there. There was a lot of damage to the car, but it wasn't in terrible condition. It looked like it would have been a, a jarring accident, but not one that somebody shouldn't have walked away from. Desperate for more clues, police call the gas station in Brooks, Oregon, where Leah last used her debit card for gas. They obtain surveillance footage from the time she should have been in the store. What they find is telling. They were able to see Leah going into the store and paying for a transaction and leaving. Uh, and she was by herself. She's wearing a hat, and it's sped up, but it's her. A closer look at the video shows Leah peering out the door while she waits for the clerk to ring her up. Since there are no cameras outside the store, what she is looking at remains unknown. But the footage leaves investigators confident that Leah appeared to be fine just hours before she arrived in Bellingham. The shows are alive and well on her journey up to Mount Baker. Evidence from the car further leads investigators to believe this was a solo trip across the country. She came out with a guitar, camera, lots of CDs, all her clothes, um, writing stuff. We didn't see anything that looked like uh, she was just traveling with somebody else. Did Leah, as the second man in the Bellingham restaurant says, 
really meet up with a man named Barry just 13 hours later? We don't believe she had any friends out here. We don't believe she drove out here with anybody but herself. She was at the restaurant by herself. So this individual, Barry, um, we, we just can't verify it. Police are stumped. Why would the man from the restaurant invent a suspect? Does he know more about Leah than he is letting on? His behavior became very odd. We tried to figure out what role he had to play. Was it just sitting down and having lunch with her, or was there more? According to police, he says he never saw Leah again after that Monday afternoon at the restaurant. But with no further evidence, Leah Roberts' case begins to go cold. Police from the Whatcom County Sheriff's Department ask her sister Kara what they should do with Leah's car. You hear all the time about cases that are solved 10, 15 more years down the road by some new piece of evidence that they go back and find. So I was pretty adamant that I wanted them to keep the car. The years go by. And Leah's 1993 Jeep Cherokee sits idly in a secure facility maintained by the Whatcom County Sheriff's Department. What was once a symbol of freedom for Leah is now a lonely reminder of shattered dreams. Could this wrecked shell still hold the missing piece of the puzzle? Almost seven years have passed and the case of the missing woman from North Carolina is still unsolved. The original detective on the case retires, passing on Leah's files to Detective Collins and his colleague, Detective Alan Smith. This cold case uh, really drew me in. Um, as far as I started reading the story about Leah, I really wanted to, with fresh eyes, look at it again. We began re-examining the evidence. Now, when we were doing that, we discovered that there were parts of her vehicle that hadn't been fully examined. I was sitting at my desk, and I'm, you know, reading the report, and I said, you know, what hasn't been done is no one's ever opened up the hood. When the two detectives pry open the damaged hood, what they find provides a viable explanation for the most baffling factor in Leah's disappearance, that at the time of the crash, no one appears to have been in the car. At the time the state patrol examined the car, they said the seatbelt hadn't been stretched. There was no evidence of anybody in the car, no blood in the vehicle. But the car had to have been accelerating at significant speed to go over the embankment. Seven years later, investigators find a shocking explanation. It appeared as though the Jeep had been tampered with and that it would have taken somebody with a knowledge of a mechanic in order to do that level of tampering with the vehicle. We found that the cover on the starter relay had been removed, which made it possible for somebody to turn the key on, push the starter relay, and have the vehicle accelerate on its own. Investigators finally have a technical explanation for how the car could have been started from the outside and accelerated without a driver. With this new information, police are drawn back to their initial possible suspect, the second man from the restaurant who is believed to be the last person to see Leah alive. He has experience as a mechanic and experience from the military, so we believe that he would fit the description of a viable suspect. Police decide to process the car one more time. What they find is the break they've been waiting for. On the inner underside of the hood, we found a series of fingerprints that weren't documented during the original investigation. With this new evidence, police track down their possible suspect, who is now living in Canada. They contact Canadian authorities and request that they fingerprint him and get a sample of his DNA. Meanwhile, investigators decide to re-examine all of Leah's belongings. They hope to find DNA evidence that could have been overlooked before, which might match him or someone else. There is a whole bunch of clothing that's being reprocessed for DNA. The articles that were most likely to provide a DNA sample were submitted to the FBI's lab. There is a chance that after seven years, advances in technology will now be able to identify traces of DNA that were previously undetectable. We believe there's DNA that would link someone to Leah's disappearance. And we're gonna look for that match. But detectives are in for a long and difficult wait. 
It takes them over two years to obtain DNA and fingerprints from their possible suspect in Canada. And when they do, they find the fingerprints are not a match. In the spring of 2010, there is better news. A crime lab finally finds male DNA on an item left behind in Leah's car. Tests are now underway, and police are on the brink of finally finding out if it matches their possible suspect. We've just recently received results that say that they do have classifiable DNA and that they can compare it against something, which is very timely considering we just got the DNA evidence from the suspect in Canada. Hopefully we'll rule them out. Or we'll rule them in. We, we don't know. Through the years, while waiting for answers from the DNA evidence, Detective Collins and his team have done everything they can to keep Leah's case alive. Just a year and a half ago, went and researched the area with cadaver dogs and metal detectors. The idea is maybe we can find something. After all this time, the hope of finding Leah's remains in the area where her car crashed is unlikely. But detectives know there is a part of Leah that will literally never decompose. The metal rod placed in her leg following her car accident 13 years before. The metal rod has a number to it and it's ascribed to Leah. And that's not going anywhere. One day, we will find her final resting place. As they have moved on in life, Heath and Kara Roberts are not willing to give up all traces of hope that one day they will see their little sister's infectious smile and once again feel the warmth of her generous spirit. I think about her all the time. It's like someone died, even though we don't have any real proof that she did or didn't. I'd like to find out what happened to her, and I wish I could have her back. I'm going to hang on to her memories, and I'm not going to mourn for Leah because we don't have a body. She's not been found dead or alive. I'm realistic, but I'm going to hang on to that piece of hope until someone proves otherwise.